Nancy Ladd, and you've tuned in for Polka Music at Nancy's Place. Today we have a very special guest. His name is Marty Sintek. We'll be talking about his recording called Project Polka and other things he's done in his lifetime and career in polka music. So stay tuned. A lot of great information as well as great polka music coming right up. Thanks for coming and being here at Nancy's Place. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask you a couple questions, if that's all right. Well, I'm glad you're asking me to be on your place. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. And I thank you for that. How, uh, how'd you begin playing polka music? How? I, well, it's, uh, I mean, as far as the playing polka music, well, yeah, I think everybody will say Frank Yankovic got the polka music going. Okay. But however, my uncle used to play polkas years ago back in the 30s before blue skirt waltz and all that kind of stuff okay my uncle frenchy and uh used to play a chromatic accordion and i just used to love to go to pitniks where he was playing and hear him play i don't even know to this day who the guys were that played with him but that's that's probably where my initial feel for polkas came was through family and, okay uh, take it from there i guess huh <laughs> Influenced your your music. You, you mentioned your your uncle. What? Who? You know, how old were you when you started? And and I know that your uncle influenced you, but who influenced a lot of your music? I mean, who do you feel was inspiring to you? A leading question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the the style that I the music, the kind of music I like to play, I uh, was highly influenced by Johnny Pecan's style. Uh, however, initially. It was Yankovic, but that was when John was playing with him, and there was something about that music that that kind of just got to me. It made me want to play, and then when the divorce of the band took place, I kind of listened to Pecan, and that's the kind of music I started to play. And I maybe I was guilty of playing too much Pecan sometimes. I I never found my own style. I never did find a style. So, but it, it, as far as the style of music I played, I'd have to say it was Johnny Pecan, okay, and Lou Trebar. Just the intricate work, is that what grabbed your attention? The, or The melody flow of the songs, the, the, the chord progressions, and the feel. There's a lot of feel that John had in uh, 
it seemed like when I would listen to his records, I could I could feel I can I could even actually distinguish the two separate accordions. Mm -hmm. I uh, I'm saying what I'm saying is my ears were relatively good, and I could hear tree bar, and I can hear pecan playing, and it was up to me to pick whichever one I wanted to follow in the song, and I could hear all the chords being played in there. So, and it was a lot to do, it was hard to learn, and that might have been the reason it was a challenge for me to be able to play like that. Okay. And I don't think I ever learned how to do it yet, but I keep, <laughs> I keep trying it. I'm still trying to play like him, but I wouldn't, <laughs> but that was my highly influence as, as to how I played. instrument that you played or when did you start playing accordion did you like did you want to play the drums a lot of kids say oh I wanted to play the drums when I was a kid no it was the first and only choice because again that's that came from my uncle I always wanted to play the accordion I used to sit on bandstands watching him play the little six seven year old kid and I always did want to play and only the accordion Really? And I started playing when I was eight years old. I started taking lessons. Did you did you read music or was no, it by ear? I learned. No, I did take lessons and I did okay. read music a little bit to a point. I could not read sight wise. I could not read a chart for immediate play. But I could read music and then work on it and then play it. Yes, no, it wasn't sticky. But mainly, I'd say most of the stuff I played and learned. Uh, after the, my, my lessons, after two years of lessons, till I was 10 years old, I did quit. But then after that, I did play by ear. I could hear things. And I could hear... After the, my, my lessons, after two years of lessons, till I was 10 years old, I did quit. But then after that, I did play by ear. I could hear things. And I could hear extra specially good. And I could pick up the songs just by listening to a record or something. So so then along with the two years of music, I know the G, where, where the notes are on the scale. Uh, I sure. put it all together. I did teach myself most of the stuff after that. I only had two years of lessons. Oh, wow. Two years.
here comes the big questions now. <laughs> when did you start your band, and who was in it? Uh, okay, now I'll, I'll ask you a question. Which band do you want me to start with? My very the first, first one. Very first band. Yes. Uh, I was about 14 years old, and I had a couple of cousins. And we used to play on a bar in a bar on 45th and St. Clair, called Kunzels. It's a little tavern, corner tavern, and one cousin played mandolin. The other cousin played guitar. Then we had the other brother, he played a violin. So we started playing there. That was like in about 40, 46, 47. And that's about the time Yankovic was coming out with some of his songs. And we played in this little tavern for pop and potato chips and $5 for the whole night. <laughs> but that's what it was. It was uh, my, co my three cousins, Steve and uh, Stanley, who now does stuff with Frankie Spedich. Okay. Okay. Stanley and his brother Rudy used to play violin. And that was my very, very first band. Okay. Okay. Now a lot of a lot of our audience will know you from Project Polka. Who was with you on that recording? Okay, who was on well, that's a good question. Okay, we had Fred Sonnell. Uh and he Bob played Champagne. It, and who what did they what each what did each one play? Oh, okay, yeah. He Just the so that if somebody oh, yeah. Sure. Of course you do, I know that. <laughs> 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 yeah, Fred Sonnell played bass. My brother Larry played drums. Bob Champagne played saxophone. And I played accordion. Uh, we did have on the album Al Market played banjo. Okay. Okay. How did you get the idea to have that cover? Now, I don't know if anybody knows what actually is on the cover. I'm sure they do out there, but uh, <laughs> construction, I mean, when I think of when I think of Marty Sintek, I think of that Project Polka, and I think, okay, wow, what a neat, wh how, where'd you go to take the picture? <laughs> How'd you pick that front, you know, where you guys are all kind of hanging out? It looks, you know. At that time, <laughs> I was doing engineering work. Okay. Electrical engineers. And, well, for 30 years, my life was concerned. Construction and uh, to start to start the recording, it became a project. <laughs> it, it became quite a project because there were some songs I needed just prior to the recording sessions. I needed to come up with fast. I needed to have six songs, and I had to come up with them very fast. And not much t time to work on them. So that was the part of project part. So okay. just with those two words, project and polka. Okay, so you're looking at a construction project, and all the jobs we did where I worked were projects. Okay. So I figured, well, it's a simple two piece, and uh, just threw it out that way. And then they happened to have a construction site going up on uh, Bishop Road in Route Six. Okay, what were they building? They were building a gold circle. A gold, gold circle, circle, really? And uh, uh, what was the grocery store now? <clears throat> uh, boy, I can't think of the grocery store name now. But that's that whole complex that where Lowe's is at now down there on okay. Rich, on Rich uh, Chardon Road at 84. Okay. That was that whole corner. That's where we took the pictures. And at the temperature that morning, we took the pictures. Would like to freeze the sax player's hand on the saxophone. It was 30, Ooh. about 34 degrees out there. Wow. The guy was a friend of mine who took the pictures. He had a 35 millimeter camera. He had to go in his car, keep the car running with the heat on it. Heat the camera up, come out, take a couple of shots, go back inside because this camera would freeze on him. Oh, you have to go wow. back into the car and heat the camera up so he, the mechanism would work. So that was quite a, it was quite a project all the way around. Even, <laughs> even taking the pictures, it was oh, a project. Wow. So that was in April 1971. Wow. 1971. But that's where that, that site is at. Okay, I was I, I was I always wondered yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. Was it was it hard to, you know, produce an LP at that time? I mean, was it hard to get someone to back you? Well, I was approached by uh, Al Market, and he uh, initiated the fact that he wanted me to cut cut an album, and he, along with uh, Joe Godina, okay. were going to back the project up. Let's go that project word again. Right? <laughs> yeah, so that that's how it started with Al Market because we were. Quite, quite a good friends through the Polecat Association, and Al approached me about cutting a record, and so I figured, well, my, why not? Why do it? Why not do it? So he, along with Joe Godina and John Krasancic, okay, set the whole thing up and uh, 
Sharon, was it Sharon, Pennsylvania, Greenville, Greenville, Pennsylvania, or something, I think it was. Wow. And it's, John Krasansky got a brand new studio. He just started, he didn't even have all the microphones there yet. He had a couple of telephones, but he was waiting for some more. So it was a, like a brand new thing up there for him, too. He, sure. to P.O. Box 43313, Cleveland, Ohio, 44143, or email me, nancy at polkas.com. Write me and tell me what you think about Nancy's place. All right. Now I'm really going to pick out some oh, really good questions. Pick, you may hear some stuttering on this. All right, that's okay. Um, for your, You've played a lot of different places. Is there a specific place that you remember as being one of the favorite places to play? Or where did you do most of your playing? Were, were it weddings? Was it you know tavern jobs? Did you travel much? Those kind of questions. Uh, there, there was a little bit of everything in there. I think uh, towards the the end, like the in the, the six, late sixties, we were playing a lot of weddings, a lot of weddings. But as far as the, the, the establishments, the bars or lounges, or whatever we're going to talk about, uh, there was the Sahara Lounge. We had Glen Park, Chapel of Glen Park Cafe. We had Gady Bar. We had Fritz's Bar. And then Chapel's other place out here in the middle of sixties, out in East Lake here. Okay. Played in there, uh, White Horse Tavern on Harvard Avenue, uh, Golden Mule down on Harvard Avenue of 71st off of Harvard, and uh, which used to be the Golden, uh, yeah, Golden something. But it, when I played with the Golden Mule, Chagrin Tavern out in East Lake here. Okay. Uh, played there quite a bit. Uh, Spotlight okay. for the different owners that played for the Blotniks, Kramer. Sure. Played for uh, Vince Globokar when he owned it. Uh, I think I played there once or twice for Joey, maybe, when Joey Biscuit owned it. But the, the, the places were starting to dwindle. Oh, Tim Coe's, played in mm -hmm. Tim Coe's place. But the places were starting to dwindle a little bit by then. We, we were kind of getting away from the area of St. Clair. Okay. Because as far as bands playing in St. Clair bars, it wasn't happening too much anymore. Any time you play down there would be for a dance at the Sloganian Hall. You know? So most of the stuff was out Easter. Played some stuff out in uh, Paintsville. The, uh, uh, used to be a bowling alley out there. I can't think of the name of that place now. Played in there for a couple of things. The people from Fairport Harbor would come down there. Sure. Uh, other than that, I can't think of the, the too many other bars. I'm, if I think of some later on, I'll sure. just stick them in there. Sure. <laughs> uh, do you have a favorite place to play? Or do you have a favorite memory of one of the jobs that just kind of sticks out over your career? No, they're all the same. They're all jobs. <laughs> well, work, <laughs> work and drinking. Yeah, there was the, I almost forgot one. Uh, Playmates was up on Warrensville Road. Okay. They had some stuff going there in the uh, early seventies. No, it, it was just. Uh, I don't think I had a favorite place. Uh, there were some favorite people that were at the places, but uh, I, I would. I wouldn't play any place like I could get a job, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so there was Sahara Lounge was nice. Uh, maybe it was because of the crowds that were there at the time. Uh, I, I don't know what it was. That was one of the nice places to play. And you had to be able to play to, play to get in there. 
sure. They audition you guys or just just by no, reputation? They, they would hear, yeah, they would hear by reputation and then uh, you'd go in and look for the job and if they have heard about you, heard good stuff about you, they would hire you. Then if they heard bad stuff about you, did they hire you anyway? Probably, uh, <laughs> if, they, if they got stuck for a band, they probably would, yeah. <laughs> if some band called on a Friday night and said we can't play Saturday, well, then they probably called Cynthia, come on down and play. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll play for you. Same price. <laughs> Looking for polka music? Visit the Nancy's Place Polka Store. If you have a Visa or MasterCard and access to the internet, you can order some of your favorite polka music, CDs, cassettes, and videos from the comfort of your own home shipped directly to your front door. At the Nancy's Place Polka Store, you can find such artists as Frankie Yankovic, Gaylord Klanschnik, Lynn Marie Rink, Roger Bright, Dick Taddy, Dick Piller, Crusade, Vernon Steve Meisner, The Casuals, and many more. You can find the Nancy's Place Polka Store at www.polkas.com. Now, Marty, I know you've you've written quite a few tunes over the years. Is there? Uh, do you think there was one bestseller or one that really went over well? One Wish, uh, Lucky Lindy, those were ones that I know that a lot of people play. Uh, do, I mean, do you think there was any other ones, or, or you know, can you tell us a little bit about One Wish or oh, Lucky I Lindy? I can really go into that real heavily. Let's take One Wish. Maybe I will. Okay, One Wish. All right, One Wish <clears throat> has been recorded now approximately eight times seven or eight times wow. believe me and I have not recorded any of those other times except the original time so seven other bands have recorded that song and uh, I think two of the recordings were button boxes yeah two were button boxes playing uh, they were it's also known by another name some what? were recorded it mm-hmm. one was recorded under the name of a waltz for Joey Okay. And uh, that was recorded by Wal- Walter Ostanek. And then uh, also Frankie Spedish picked up on it just recently, a year or so ago. He re-recorded it as a waltz for Joni or Joni's waltz or something to that effect. Uh, so, but those are One Wish waltzes. And it's been recorded by Tom Sick and Lynn Marie. Okay. They recorded it. Sure. Uh, Zapanchik Brothers recorded it. Oh, God, I don't have the list. Steve Meisner? Yeah, Meisner, yeah, Steve Meisner. Uh, there, there's, there's. I wish I had. I should have prepared myself for that part <laughs> because I know I have counted at one time when I, I was trying to initiate a, uh, a voting for it oh, okay. for popularity, and I did have a list of the times it was recorded, and it was recorded sure. at that time seven times. Now since then, it's been recorded again by Frankie Spellich, which would make it eight times, counting my initial recording of it. So how'd, that, you, how'd you come up with that? Did you just sit around and, and does it come to you? It, I mean, when, it, you, when you go to write a song. It was one of the quickest songs I think I ever wrote. I probably really? did, I did that song probably in one night or maybe a half the next day to put the words to it. It was one of my fastest songs and I didn't think too much of it myself. A very simplistic song. It had some nice passages in it, but... I never thought it would be the song that it was. All the other songs I wrote on that album, there there was a lot of work in some of those songs. <laughs> and, and the only guy I know that plays them all, you play them? Uh, I, for a fact, is Rob the Blander. Okay. He, him and Kenny uh, 
Klachnik. Uh-huh. I, mean, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that last name right. This, <laughs> this big is Slovenian, Klachnik, okay? <laughs> All right. They may call it Klanik, I don't know, but I'm going to call him Klachnik. Kenny Klachnik, to this day, is all over me about the lousy keys I wrote those songs in. <laughs> because they're the toughest keys for sex players. But he loves the songs, and him along with Rob the Blander, they just love to play all the songs of my album. Not just those two, Lucky Lindy and One Wish. They just love the other songs. So I, it makes me feel good that it's coming from my peers, so sure. to speak. Uh, and who am I? I mean, you know. But they love the songs. <laughs> All right, well, let's listen to uh, One Wish. If you could make one wish that you now hold so dear, the wish that would be taking you back through. Daddy's charms seem oh so clear If you could make that wish that you hold dear with a reminder that polkas are now on the internet. That's right, the happiest music on the planet is now worldwide. You can find Nancy's Place at www.polkas.com. Or for more information, write to Nancy's Place, P.O. Box 43313, Cleveland, Ohio, 44143. Don't forget, that's polkas on the internet, www.polkas.com. Okay, we just listened to One Wish. Uh, another one of the tunes that has been recorded probably several times is Lucky Lindy. What do you want to say about that? Uh, yeah, that, that song, that has a little bit of history. And then I'm surprised uh, when back in the 80s, early 80s, I was doing some bus trips with Myler McConaughey. And I would play these songs on the bus. And many of the people thought I actually wrote that song. Well, I had to bust a lot of bubbles on that one because I had nothing to do with writing that song or the words. I initially heard that song back in the early, late 60s probably, on the radio. They were commemorating the flight of Charles Lindbergh. Okay. And they played this song. And for some reason, it, it just seemed to fill my mind and... Uh, as I mentioned one time before, I could hear a song and I could know how that song goes and I could play that song at home within two hours. I, could, I will not forget that song on the chords or anything. I can pick it up. Wow. And that song haunted me. It just, <laughs> that song could be such a beautiful song on a polka. Mm-hmm. It, it got some nice words to it. So the only, the only part that was bad about it, I didn't have the words memorized. I knew how the song went, and then naturally, as a polka, it would have to have a second part, a bridge. Sure. So that wouldn't be too difficult. I could put something in there, but the words were something, I don't know how I could acquire the word, because the song was written in 1927. Oh, wow. Okay, 1927. So at the time, I was doing some work with Bruce Berger, and we were over at his house one night rehearsing. And uh, I ran it by him, and his father happened to be there, Arnold Berger. I never forget Arnold Berger, a lovely guy. And Mrs. Berger, too, two lovely people, really nice people. And I threw it at Arnold Berger, Bruce's father. I said, boy, I says, is there any way we can get the words for this song? And uh, he happened to have a wire recording of it. Wow. Imagine that, a wire, not, not a CD, not a cassette, not a 7-inch reel-to-reel or whatever. No, this was a wire recording from back in the 20s. Wow. He had a copy on a wire recorder. So fortunately, I got the words from Arnold, and thanks to Bruce, who helped go with the father to get the, sure. the words for me. And I decided to put it on my album. 
and uh, it isn't a place I don't walk into if certain bands are playing. If you take your Rolex and your Kravis and your Pecan, and I haven't walked in on an Eric No Capper job. Yet, <laughs> I'm sure if I walk into any of those jobs where these guys are playing, they will always play those songs and they always make me come up and sing it. Sing the words. So therefore, that's I only great. have to keep the words in my pocket. When I go out, and that's the, that's the standing joke with, with uh, Jeff up there and Paul, that, hey, Marty, you got your words? Okay, make sure, come on up here and do the singing. But anyways, uh, those songs are probably big songs for me. Uh, Lucky Lindy was recorded, I think, only once besides myself. I think Palumbi did it. And Columbia. And Rodick. And Rodick? Yeah. Okay, Rodick, Rodick on his too. big one. Yeah, Rodick. I'm sorry. Sorry, Eddie. Yeah, so that's <laughs> twice, yeah. Uh, so Lucky Lindy was a very, a very strange song for me. But there was just something, when I originally heard the song, I only heard it one time again, I mean, after that. Really? And uh, it just was something about that song. It's a very cute song. And I apologize to all those people. <laughs> if I gave you an impression that I wrote that song, I did not write Lucky Lindy. Words or music. That's it. Final. All right. We'll we'll play that tune, and here is Lucky Lindy. Okay, I have to apologize to Bobby Kravitz because I forgot. Uh, honest, Bob, I'm really sorry, okay, that you did record that song also on your number three or four album, okay? Bobby Kravitz did, in fact, write... Uh, not right, play, <laughs> recorded, Lucky Lindy. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I'm sure many other bands have played it. I know I, I've been to several different yeah. dances, and uh, that yeah. tune is... A lot of them do play it. Yeah. yeah. But the recording part was, uh, like you mentioned... Uh, Rodick and Kravis and Palumbi. Palumbi. Mm -hmm. That we know of yeah. at this mm -hmm. present second. Mm -hmm. Well, I know you've done a lot of different things over the years. You've had many different accomplishments, not only just playing and recording, um, but you, you also had something to do with the All Nations Festival in Cleveland? Yes, that goes back to the 60s, I believe. Uh, 71, maybe 70s. 70, 71, someplace in there. <clears throat> I fortunately was chosen by the union along with Al Tersick, Don Kotnick, Dick Fleischman, and there was one other, uh, Henry Brosey. We were selected by the Musicians Union to put this All Nation Festival together along with the city of Cleveland, which was held at the mall, okay. downtown Cleveland. And Mall C? Mall C, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, that was that was probably, uh, one of my highlights of, of my career, being able to be part of that. There was times I would play for it, but twice that we were involved in it for about three or four years. And then, uh, but twice I was the one who had to set the bands up, get the bands, and put them in position on the different stages. And then I also was in charge of the All-Star Band, which okay. I would have to put together of all the musicians that didn't play there with a band. 
I because see. we couldn't put all the musicians with all the bands on one night, so we had to split it up somewhat. And in some years, the other bands would play, and the other guys would be all stars or whatever. Now, for those that might not know or might not be familiar with the All Nations Festival, um, do you want to? Is that uh, was that something that was just for the ethnic people in Cleveland, or what? You know, give us a little background on. It, it what primarily it started was. as an ethnic thing with the uh, the Polish, the Slo- Slovaks, and Slovenians, and, and Croatians. Basically, that was initially how. They were trying to boost the polka, the polka situation, which is your Polish, Slovaks, and Croatian. They all play polkas and Slovenians. And it was to initiate a system where uh, the people will start to appreciate all this kind of music because work was getting very slow out there. And you needed to promote all this kind of music. Sure. And uh, the only way we had promotion back then was what the local disc jockeys, which were, they were kind of restricted as to where they were who they were getting to. Okay. And we thought this would be something else. But then it did, it did develop into a broader spectrum with uh, some Afro-American music, Hispanic music, and rock and roll then eventually. And then uh, for some unknown reason, which I was not in it at the end, when the concept totally... Uh, Disbanded well, was, more Yeah, they just they stopped doing it. I think maybe because the city of Cleveland, they used to fund this part of it. Okay. The musicians were, were paid by the Musicians Union, and the city of Cleveland would do anything else that it cost in the way of putting things up for it. Okay. Uh, acquiring of the property, uh, whatever else it took. Uh, the city of Cleveland had a hand in that. Uh, they also, prior to that weekend, we would have that, <clears throat> we would be booking bands at the front of many of the uh, hotels and establishments downtown. I see. Through the union again and through the city of Cleveland, they had this musical program down there. And many times we would play, well, many years, three or four years, we would play in front of a hotel for a couple of hours, like the Hotel Carter, Hotel Hamilton, uh, a business, just a, a store, whatever was we would have bands playing out there and it, it, it got to be a very popular thing that's how we got involved with a total ethnic thing with with the hispanics and rock even rock and roll music got to be part of this down the road and then once the nation the, the all nation festival ceased they still continued the downtown music okay but it was kind of concentrated with more of the rock and roll Hispanics and Afro-American because whatever the reasons were most of the polka musicians were part-time musicians anyways and we couldn't get the afternoons off to play these affairs and they were doing something to liven up downtown Cleveland well, the hotels all had a outside usually had a lovely nice day and we'd play out in front of the lobby and uh, it was nice you know, all the musicians got paid and got a little publicity and uh, it was really nice I was one of the founding fathers of that I have a certificate from Boinovich to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really neat. Yeah, it was nice. Gather around, friends, gather around, and I will try to sing you a song. Song about my girlfriend, I love to hear. All that she drank was ice cubes and beer. Ice cubes and beer, was ice cubes and beer. All that she drank was ice cubes and beer. She was my honey, I loved her dear. All that she drank was ice cubes and beer. of musicians that kind of uh, banded together, had different groups put together to try to run dances and things like that. One that is very familiar to a lot of people in the Cleveland area would be the Polecats. Right. What can you tell me about the Polecats? I can tell you a whole lot about the Polecats. <laughs> a lot you won't want to hear. <laughs> so maybe I won't tell you all that. All right. Uh, it, it, the main purpose was to promote the Polecats, to keep keep it going, because things were dwindling. It wasn't it wasn't like it was in 46, 47, when Yankovic was really popular, and Polecats were played in jukeboxes at the hotels downtown, restaurants downtown. And I remember going to a couple of proms in 50, 51, so the restaurants downtown and the hotels, they were playing polkas on the jukeboxes. Wow. It was something, you, you couldn't <laughs> believe it. There wasn't any establishment in Cleveland that wasn't playing polkas. But then it started to dwindle. Sure. Okay. But there was the Polkas Club. They were initiated, I believe, in either 1945 or 46. Uh, a group of guys come out of the service and polka members, bands. Sure. And they decided to start this club. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many guys there were, maybe 10 or whatever, 15. 
and one of the main characters in there, and I call him character, was Frank Piccarello. Okay. Good old Frankie. He used to play with Georgie Cook. And he knew the history on that early part. And after a couple of years, I guess they were a social club also. They would have, they would do bowling or whatever. It was just okay. to get together, but also promoting polkas with the dances and that. Well, I think in a couple of years, it kind of fell apart. Guys got married or whatever it was, and, and it just they just separated more or less. But then we picked the club back up in 19... I was not part of the original group. Okay. I didn't come in until either 56 or 57. Hanging out with all these guys, playing with them on a different job, Piccarello, the Cernics, and all these guys. Sure. One night we're sitting in the bar, we decided to start the club up again. And we did start the club up. And the end result was that at one time we had 60 members of that wow. polka. We promoted polkas, we threw dances, we threw picnics, whatever. It, it was still, it, it was a promotional for polkas, but we also kept it a social club for the members. Family, okay. Christmas parties for the wives and the children. Sure. We had a bowling league, mm -hmm. which I was secretary for, I think, three <laughs> or four years. Kept all the records. What was we your a, average? We had. <laughs> yeah, just right. <laughs> yeah. I made some good money in that one, too. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't cheat on the averages either. I had, had to be pretty straight with those, or else you'd hear it from the guys, you know. And we also had an infamous baseball team, softball team. We had a softball team for, oh, what, four or five years? Five years. And uh, we had quite a record, quite a losing record. I think we're lucky a couple of years we won three games maybe, okay? <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. And we played in Euclid. In oh, really? Slope, when they first started our slow pitch league in 58 or 57, 58, 59, someplace in there. And we became part of that league. It was mostly guys that, like factory workers, would get together and play baseball in the evening, you know. And we kind of got into that league. Well, then, after a couple of years of that, uh, softball became very popular, <laughs> and they started getting these younger guys in there, uh, high school ball players, uh -huh. uh, guys who were like six foot three, six foot four, two hundred and forty pounds. <laughs> well, all of a sudden we saw the demise of our baseball team because we couldn't <laughs> compete with these guys. But it was a wonderful club. Uh, I I did leave the club in 1963 uh, for whatever reason I don't remember right now, okay. but I did leave the club in 1963, and it continued for quite a few years after that. I'm not sure when it totally disbanded. Yeah, I, I'm not sure myself either. In the I 80s think maybe, late probably 80s, late like 80s, early 90s. Yeah, so it did exist for quite a while. And, uh, did they work with the unions in order to hire the bands, or was it just strictly? You, you mentioned it was more, uh, more as a social club as well. Did, did it just? Hey, we're gonna have a dance, and uh, we'll have Marty. You play, and you bring you know the guys that you're playing with now, and. Next week we'll bring, you know, Art Perko or whatever, no, whoever we, we was had in there. Almost all the polka people, the players, in the club at one time. Okay. We had the, the, the Bajilic band in there. Okay. They were in it, so we were able to cover Polish music and everything else. I said, we, you know, we had the polka bands, Polish, Slovenian, and we had the Germans. Okay. And we had the uh, Bohemian. Oh, wow. Uh, I think that guy, not Benio, I can't think of that guy's name. Anyways, <clears throat> at one time, we decided, well, the club decided they wanted a volunteer to throw another dance for one year. That was 1962, 61. And nobody was volunteering to be chairman of this dance. <laughs> so I stuck my hand up, and I volunteered for it. Mm-hmm. And after I stuck my hand up and volunteered and got got to be the chairman of this dance, I didn't know what the hell to do. <laughs> I heard, okay, so you better get yourself a committee together. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, I knew who to pick. I picked Frank Piccarillo, Bobby Timko, Lenny Sanders, and uh, Chuck Smith. Okay. And I figured, these guys got talents in a couple of different areas, so I'll have this as my committee. Fortunately for me, they decided to go along with me and be on my committee. <laughs> or else I, I'd have been lost without them, really. <laughs> and then we had to pick the place to have the stands. We formerly had them at Rayhurst or wherever, Serena sure. Homes out there. The picnic were naturally at the picnic grounds. But I wanted to do something different. Uh, don't ask me why. My creativity, I don't know. But I, I knew that we had the band. I wanted to recognize the fact that we had the Polish bands in our club. And for them to come out east, 
There's a lot of people that like the Polish music too. Sure. So I jumped off the bridge and I booked Aragon Ballroom. Okay. We never had a dance at Aragon Ballroom. And if any of the old timers are still around, they'll know how big that ballroom was. And uh, so I threw that up at the, one of the meetings and I said, we're gonna, I decided to have the dance at the Aragon Ballroom. Well, <laughs> I, caught, I caught some short words on that one. Like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? You can't do it, it's too big. Do it, blah, 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 blah. Well, after the meeting, I stuck to my guns and Pecan walked up to me, John. He says, uh, good idea, Marty. Good idea. We can do it. Don't change your mind. Keep it there. We can do it. Well, the end result of that was with the promotion, I think Bobby Timko was on that part of the committee, uh, Lenny Sanders, uh, like I say, Chuck Smith, and Frank Piccarello. Between the five or six of us, we end up having 788 people come to that dance. Wow. <laughs> at the Aragon Ballroom. And a lot of them were the Polish people from the South Side. Wow. We had all the bands play. And as a matter of fact, that's probably the first and only time I ever played with Johnny Peacock. Because <laughs> for some reason, Lou wasn't there that night. I don't know whether he was still in the club yet or not, or he was ill or whatever. But I got to play, yeah, I got to play second accordion with Peacock, right? Yeah, okay, give me a break already. And I was up there and I got to play with John up that night. But we had Bajulix up there playing. We had German bands playing that night. We had different, all the different guys were playing with their, the bands out of the club. Some bands were in the club fully. Okay. Like Vandals were all in the club. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Perko had most of his guys, if not all of them, in the club. So it was pretty much complete bands. If not, we had bands that we, we had good musicians in there that you could put any four or five guys together and there was no problem with a beautiful sound coming out of the band. Whatever they decided to play, they could play. No problem with that. over the years and uh, just recently uh, the last thing that was recorded uh, I believe was Step by Step and yes. that was done by Bobby Cravis Bobby Cravis yes yeah he had quite a few tunes yet and got many ice box and, uh, but that was the last one recorded Step by Step well we're going to give that a listen but before we do I want to say thanks for coming and being a part of Nancy's Place I really am honored that you actually took the time to uh, be part of the interview and uh, I hope we can do this again real soon no I really hate to tell you this but I really enjoyed this <laughs> okay well great <laughs> and I want to thank you for the opportunity to oh, be able to do this for you thank you very much okay. Marty you keep me you keep me in the music business yet good but I'm not going to play too much anymore <laughs> <laughs> I don't do too much of that playing myself so I understand again thanks very much you're quite welcome and I thank you okay bye uh, bye 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 Through the night in my arms, you're all that's right. We know that feeling of stealing some part of the night. Step by step, oh, you bet, we're sailing along. You and I, with our magic song, we'll dance forever and ever. But just step by step. 